I stood tiptoe upon a little hill by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Sergio Baldelli. I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. The air was cooling and so very still that the sweet buds, which with the modest pride pulled droopingly in slanting curve aside, there scantily leaved and finely tapering stems had not yet lost those sturdy diadems caught from the early sobbing of the morn. The clouds were pure and white as the flocks new shorn, and fresh from the clear brook. Sweetly they slept on the blue fields of heaven, and then there crept a little noiseless noise among the leaves, born of the very sigh that silence heaves for not the faintest motion could be seen of all the shades that slanted o'er the green there was wider wandering for the greedy sty to peer about upon variety far round the horizon's crystal air to skim and to trace the dwindled edgings of its brim to picture out the quaint and a curious bending of a fresh woodland alley never ending or by the bowery clefts and leafy shelves guess where the jaunty streams refresh themselves i gazed a while and felt as light and free as though the fanning wings of a mercury had played upon my heels i was lighter-hearted and many pleasures to my vision started so i straightway began to pluck a posy of luxuries bright, milky, soft and rosy, a bush of May flowers with the bees about them, are ah, sure no tasteful nook would be without them, and let a lush laburnum oversweep them, and let a long grass grow round the roots to keep them a moist, cool and green, and a shade the violets that they may bind the moss in leafy nets a filbert hedge with the wild briar overtwined and clumps of woodbine taking the soft wind upon their summer thrones there too should be the frequent checker of a youngling tree that with a score of light green brethren shoots from the quaint mossiness of aged roots around which is heard a spring ahead of a clear waters babbling so wildly of its lovely daughters the spreading bluebells it may haply mourn that such fair clusters should be rudely torn from their fresh beds and scattered thoughtlessly by infant hands left on the path to die Open afresh your round of starry folds, ye ardent marigolds. Dry up the moisture from your golden lids, for great Apollo bids that in these days your praises should be sung on many harps, which he has lately strung. And when again your Dunis he kisses, tell him I have you in my world of blisses. So haply, when I rove in some far vale, his mighty voice may come upon the gale. Here are sweet peas on tiptoe for a flight, with the wings of a gentle flush over delicate white, and taper fingers catching at all things, to bind them all about with the tiny rings. Linger a while upon some bending planks that lean against the streamlet's rushy banks and watch intently nature's gentle doings they will be found softer than ring doves cooings how silent comes the water round that bend not the minutest whisper does it send to the o'erhanging sallows blades of grass slowly across the checkered shadows pass why you might read two sonnets ere they reach to where the hurrying freshness is a peach in nature's sermon o'er their pebbly beds 
where swarms of minnows show their little heads, staying their wavy bodies against the streams, to taste the luxury of sunny beans, tempered with the coonies. How they ever wrestle with their own sweet delight, and ever nestle their silver bellies on the pebbly sand. If you but scantily hold out the hand, that very instant not one will remain, but turn your eye, and they are there again. The ripples seem right glad to reach those cresses, and cool themselves among the emerald tresses. The while they cool themselves, they freshness give, and moisture, that the bowery green may live, so keeping up an interchange of favours like good men in the truth of their behaviours. Sometimes goldfinches one by one will drop from low-hung branches, little space they stop, but sip and twitter, and their feathers sleek, then off at once as in a wanton freak, or perhaps to show their black and golden wings, pausing upon their yellow flutterings. Were I in such a place, I sure should pray that naught less sweet might call my thoughts away than the softer rustle of a maiden's gown fanning away the dandelion's down, than the light music of her nimble toes patting against the sorrel as she goes how she would start and blush thus to be caught playing in all her innocence of thought oh let me lead her gently o'er the brook watch her half smiling lips and a downward look oh let me for one moment touch her wrist let me one moment to her breathing list and as she leaves me may she often turn her fair eyes looking through her locks a burn what next? A tuft of evening primroses, o'er which the mind may hover till it dozes, o'er which it well might take a pleasant sleep, but that tis ever started by the leap of buds into ripe flowers, or by the flitting of divers moths that hay their rest are quitting, or by the moon lifting her silver rim above a cloud and with a gradual swim coming into the blue with all her light o oh, maker of sweet poets dear delight of this fair world and all its gentle livers spangler of clouds hail of crystal rivers mingler with leaves and dew and tumbling streams closer of lovely eyes to lovely dreams lover of loneliness and wandering of upcast eye and tender pondering thee must i praise above all other glories that smile us on to tell delightful stories for what has made the sage or poet's right but the fair paradise of nature's light in the calm grandeur of a sober line we see the waving of the mountain pine, and when a tale is a beautiful estate, we feel the safety of a hawthorn glade. When it is moving on luxurious wings, the soul is lost in pleasant smotherings. Fair dewy roses brush against our faces, and the flowering laurels spring from diamond vases. Overhead we see the jasmine and the sweet briar, and the bloomy grapes laughing from green attire, while at our feet the voice of a crystal bubbles charms us at once away from all our troubles, so that we feel uplifted from the world, walking upon the white clouds wreathed and curled. So felt he who first told how Saki went on the smooth wind to realms of a wonderment what psyche felt and love when their full lips first touched what amorous and fondling nips they gave each other's cheeks with all their sighs and how they kissed each other's tremulous eyes the silver lamp the ravishment the wonder the darkness loneliness the fearful thunder 
their woes gone by and both to heaven upflown to bow for gratitude before jove's throne so did he feel who pulled the boughs aside that we might look into a forest wide to catch a glimpse of a fauns and a dryades coming with the softest rustle through the trees and the garlands woven of the flowers wild and sweet upheld on ivory wrists or sporting feet telling us how fair trembling syrinx fled arcadian pan with such a fearful dread poor nymph poor pan how did he weep to find naught but a lovely sighing over the wind along the reedy stream a half heard strain full of sweet desolation balmy pain what first inspired a bard of old to sing narcissus pining o'er the untainted spring in some delicious ramble he had found a little space with the boughs all woven round and in the midst of all a clearer pool than air reflected in its pleasant cool the blue sky here and there serenely peeping through tenderly wreaths fantastically creeping and on the bank a lonely flower he spied a meek and forlorn flower with a naught of pride drooping its beauty over the watery clearness to woo its own sad image into nearness deaf to light as zephyrus it would not move but still would seem to droop to pine to love so while the poet stood in this sweet spot some fainter gleamings o'er his fancy shot nor was it long ere he had told the tale of a young narcissus and sad echo's pale where had he been from whose warm head out flew that sweetest of all songs that ever knew that hay refreshing pure deliciousness coming ever to bless the wanderer by moonlight to him bringing shapes from the invisible world unearthly singing from out the middle air from flowery nests and from the pillowy silkness that rests full in the speculation of the stars ah surely he had burst our mortal bars into some wondrous region he had gone to search for thee divine endymion he was a poet sure a lover too who stood on latimus top what time there blew soft breezes from the myrtle vale below and brought in faintness a solemn sweet and slow a hymn from dion's temple while upswelling the incense went to her own starry dwelling but though her face was clear as infant's eyes though she stood smiling o'er the sacrifice the poet wept at her so piteous fate wept that such beauty should be desolate so in fine wrath some golden sounds he won and gave meek cynthia her endymion queen of the wide air thou most lovely queen of all the brightness that mine eyes have seen as thou exceedest all things in thy shine so every tale does this sweet tale of thine o oh, for three words of honey that I might tell but one wonder of thy bridal night. Where distant ships do seem to show their keels, Phoebus the while delayed his mighty wheels, and turned to smile upon thy bashful eyes, ere he his unseen pomp would solemnize. The evening weather was so bright and clear that men of health were of unusual cheer stepping like a homer at the trumpet's call or young apollo on the pedestal and lovely women were as fair and warm as venus looking sideways in alarm the breezes were ethereal and pure and crept through half-closed lattices to cure the languid sick it cooled their fevered sleep and soothed them into slumbers 
full and deep. Soon they awoke clear-eyed, nor burnt with the thirsting, nor with the hot fingers, nor with the temples bursting, and springing up, they met the wondering sight of their dear friends, nigh foolish with delight, who feel their arms and breasts and a kiss and a stare, and on their placid foreheads parted the hair. Young men and maidens at each other gazed, with the hands held back, and motionless, amazed to see the brightness in each other's eyes. And so they stood, filled with the sweet surprise, until their tongues were loosed in poesy. Therefore no lover did of anguish die. But the soft numbers, in that moment spoken, made silken ties that never may be broken. Cynthia, I cannot tell the greater blisses that followed thine, and thy dear shepherd's kisses. Was there a poet born? But now no more. My wandering spirit must no further soar. End of the poem. This recording is in the public domain.